Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Uh, we are having another look at step 27 on stillness, holy solitude of body and soul in the writing of John Climacus. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. <clears throat> it's autumn here. And the... <clears throat> the Letter of Divine Ascent, uh, which is one of those remarkable documents um, that feeds people to think what all is involved in becoming perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. And here we are at step 27, which is only you know four steps away from his completion of step 30. Um, which probably needs a word also that at step 30, that's not the end of the, the train track. Uh, you've actually, at step 30, you've really only got a full measure of what theosis is all about, what your becoming God is all about. And from my own experience, there's, there's more to it than that. You, you find that there are transformations in your spiritual life that you must sooner or later account for. There was a time when you weren't born again, for example. There's a time when you were born again. There's a time when you maybe uh, were in church or you were in some sort of organizational capacity and you started to master what it was like to be born again among other born again people. And then there comes a time when you outgrow that and it no longer feeds you. And so the, then there's a period of going through the desert where you don't want all of the things that you've traversed. You now want only God. You, you want to know the source of life. And so there is this crossing of a desert and you, you're helpless. You can't, you can't fathom anything at all. You know that you just want God and you, and you clearly know that you do not have God. You do not know God. You've got beliefs about God, but beliefs are no longer satisfying to you. And then you find God, and God reveals himself to you, and, and in the finding of God, you now traverse out of the world that you've known, and you are now walking in, in the first morning glories of, of the sunrise of your heavenly citizenship, your eternal life in heaven, in the righteousness of God. And the thing that becomes prominent in this wholly new phase of your life is that because you now have found God and you can be face to face with God, God opens up his will to you, his will, not anything like what you got from reading the Bible and, and sitting with the word of God, but now you're in a, a wholly new phase of growth where you're being fed and you're, and you're being groomed by the discernment of God's own heart of hearts, his will, God's will. And so God is real for you, and now God's will is real for you also. And in this phase of your spiritual life, there is a complete transformation of your inner reality and your self-identity and your consciousness you become far more like Christ, like Jesus of Nazareth. You become far more like him, God incarnate, than you have ever been in your entire life. And if you ever got a glimpse of who you used to be, it would be shocking to you because you would have been so isolated and so unspiritual and so full of yourself and, and, and rightfully so, but the difference is so blatant now that you are walking in quasi-heavenly currents. And, and so you can start to look back and realize, oh, there are definite stages of transformation inside of me that are going on. And if you were even at that point, that early point of knowing God, would pick up the, the ladder of divine ascent, you could relate to all 30 steps quite clearly. 
you, you, you just, you'd realize how you realized them and how God had groomed you in them. And you've only just started to know the will of God. And so as you traverse even further, you discover that there is a perfecting of the knowing of the will of God and the doing of the will of God that leads you into becoming the will of God. And there is then the realization of the actuality of theosis, where you and God's energy within you, God's consciousness within you, is your consciousness. And you're no longer, you're no longer only a person separated from God. You now have uh, two reality or three realities actually going on with you, inside of you, who you are, what, what, you, what you are. And that is that you've still got your humanness to you and you can think and be yourself without necessarily being God. You could just be, you know, Joe Blow, the farmer, who's planting his potatoes and picking his potatoes and cooking his potatoes and enjoying his family life. You can be that human being but you're not the human being that you used to be. You're now a more divine, a celestial kind of a human being here on the earth. And then you can be the godly person who is this fusion of you and the Father. And then the Father himself can be God. So he retains, God retains his God character forever. And you share this God-human reality. So you've got these three characteristics within you. And getting a handle on them, getting to walk with those, getting to know how they operate and when they operate and, and, and commanding them, that's beyond step 30 of John Climacus' Letter of Divine Ascent. And then there's something that happens when you get a mastery of, of these three attributes of your interior world. And, and it comes, it sort of comes suddenly, it comes one day, you notice something has been going on in you for some time, but now you can identify it. And there is a, there is a heavenly energy that's actually of heaven, of, of other than this world, spirituality, even the peak spirituality on this world, something other than that has now been raining down upon you. And, you're noticing it and you start to realize, glory to God, this is my heavenly citizenship. This is making me able to function in heaven as a person who is fully deified, but now able to work in heaven, able to walk and live and, and have relationships and do projects in heaven, no longer at all attached to the earth no longer with any of the material physicality that we know here in the earth. And so it starts with energy. It starts with, with a consciousness upgrade that happens. And it isn't happening through the Father inside of you, nor is it happening through Christ inside of you. It's happening through the heavenly cosmos. It's happenly, happening through the heavenly energy of how heaven functions and heaven functions through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's no two ways about it. But it has its own atmosphere. It has its own way of doing things. And you'd find that if you came into a city as a tourist or you came into a, a holy land as a pilgrim, you'd notice that all of a sudden the energy is entirely different. And so once we, once we master the sense of God's individuality within us and our individuality within us and our fusion together reality within us as us. That we are, we, we can quite easily do the will of God. We find that this heavenly citizenship comes upon us. And then we find that uh, if, we, if we haven't died by then, either deliberately or, or just because we've run out of time, um, we then find that the work that we do, we do it as, as though we literally are in heaven because our, our email address is now in heaven. Our, our position, our, our status, our identity, our, our record has brought us beyond the world. 
and not because we are an ascetic who is able to walk in the snows barefoot and, and live in the Himalayas in the snow wearing nothing but a loincloth, or that we can do incredible fasts, or we've got great powers of the Holy Spirit even. None of that. It's because we command the will of the Father inside of us and we can let God be God, we can let our humanness be our humanness and we can function through those two awarenesses through our, through our union, through our deification. We're no longer looking at deification from a human point of view. We're no longer trying to get into a God-only perspective and look at deification. We're looking at God and we're looking at ourselves through our own deification. And it's that deification that opens up and receives as a gift from God the culture of being a heavenly citizen. And that heavenly citizenship is it's not never found in the world. It is. You come across a few people who, who do speak of this and write of this and leave a legacy of this in their writings and in some of their disciples. If you had a thousand disciples, you'd be extremely fortunate if you got six who could actually walk in this. And they would still look at you like you're some hero who just had it all down pat. But they would, they would take where you've walked in it, they would take it further still. In their, in their later years because they would take what you've got and it would mature quickly in them and then they would start to they would start to toss that around their own world and their own circumstances and the challenges of their circumstances. And so what you what you find yourself doing with the ladder of divine ascent is ever present. All of the elements are still present, but they're now present at a completely different phase of theosis walk once theosis is certified in you, is granted in you, it's, it's realized in you. God has rubber stamped it in a sense. There is, I've, I've read some reports by some people who say the theosis journey is never ending. It just doesn't stop. Well, it doesn't, but the union with God does. There is, a, there is a certification point where your union with God is now perfect. And that perfect unification is called theosis. It's called becoming Christ, becoming God, you know, like that. And you grow continuously from that perspective. So there is no returning to sin. There is no falling away from God ever. It's just not, not possible any longer. It's just, it's just not there. It's like a, a tree that's been, you know, like a rose bush that's been grafted onto really good stock. Once the thing has taken and the rose is producing from the strength of the stock root and the beauty of its graft, it's at work. It's, it's, it's theosis is complete. And so it's, it's valuable, really valuable to know that there are these phases of growth and that they, they do extend beyond the uh, step 30, um, but they are rarely written about and rarely spoken of, which the reason that I'm doing this, the only reason I'm doing this is because Christ has called me to be a witness to what's in the, the 30 rungs of the ladder of divine ascent and also to speak on them from the position of what's beyond that that actually isn't mentioned um, because the stream of thinking and the stream of experience in John's day was still fairly undeveloped. It takes sometimes other generations and world changes around us to bring out more and more dimensions of heavenly theosis. So and this is not, I'm not saying this in pride, I'm just saying this is, this is what's happened for me. That, you know, and I'm, I'm nobody, it could happen to you far better than it could happen to me. It's just, I just happened to be the one that, that it's, it's happened to. So if we look here now at, at step 37, it starts out off by saying, 
Here are the signs, courses, and proofs of those who are practicing solitude in the right way. And then he's going to give some. We're going to have a look at that. I'll get you to read it. The thing I want you to pay attention to here is that we're on step 27. And it's got all of these features. And so as we look at the various features of stillness and holy solitude of body and soul, it's, first of all, I think it's good to know that there is a phase of coming into that, of exploring it. Then there's a phase of having it. And then there's a phase of moving beyond it. With every one of these steps, there's a learning about it experientially. There's the having it and the glorifying in it. And then there's the sometimes the tragedy of moving beyond it. You think, oh, I think I'm losing it. I think I might have lost it. But no, you're moving into what God's got in the spiral of life. He's, he's taking you upwards through that spiral. And it can appear like, oh, I'm, I'm losing this. But no, 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 you're coming around and here it is again. There it is. Oh, wow, yeah, look at that. I've left it all beyond, but now I can see. Ah, I've got a better perspective on it. And even that then phases away and you spiral around up again ever higher in, in what God's got for you. So, uh, Guido, would you, would you spin it out for us, please, this uh, point 37 here in step 27? Yes, for sure. Here are the signs, courses, and proofs of those who are practicing solitude in the right way. An unruffled mind, sanctified thought, rapture towards the Lord, recollection of eternal torments, the urgency of death, constant hunger for prayer, and sleeping vigilance, wasting away of lust, ignorance of attachment, death to the world, loss of gluttony, a sure understanding of divine things, a well-off discernment, a truth accompanied by tears, loss of talkativeness, and many such things which the common run of men are wont to find quite alien to them. I think the thing that stands out to me in this is that he's talking about a life with no frustrations, no irritations. Now, we've only just come to the point of wanting to, to have the monastic life separated from the life of the chickens and the roosters and the ducks. And we've given them a fair go, but actually they're starting to be more nuisance value in certain parts of the monastery now. And so we're, we've just, a couple of days ago, we rearranged some of the fencing. And we've still got these three or four renegades who are quite convinced that they live outside the wire. And so we're probably going to be moving them along because we want to get the monastic peace more deeply in place. We don't want to have our attention dragged away from us so frequently. And they do that when they're around and their demands. And so when he says here, and many such things which the common run of men and women are wont to find quite alien to them, it's because the common run of people live in a world of constant distraction. Many people will, will go on a yoga retreat, a meditation retreat. They'll go on a spiritual retreat. They'll go on, a, on a, uh, a change to quieten down, to have time unto themselves. And at such a time, all of these frustrations and, and diversions tend to be packaged in a, in a way that is conducive to getting some space in their own minds. 
And that's without God coming in. It's just something that happens. You just get some space. The responsibility is taken away off your life. We've got a guest cottage on our property, and it really says to me every time she goes there, well, not every time, sometimes she goes there, she says, oh, when I go into our cottage when the guests aren't there, I feel like I've just entered into, into a place on holiday. Everything's done for you. You know, it's so lovely. It's, <laughs> you don't have to do anything. It's just all there. And then, of course, you come back to the monastery, and the monastery is this great burden where you're doing everything. <laughs> no one's no one's doing anything for you. It's uh, well, there's more. There's more on yourself. Um, we do do things for each other. Great amount of things, actually. Um, but when we when we think of the the solitude and the stillness. It can still be a worldly thing, as John says. The common run of people are want to find quite alien to them. And we can, we can calm ourselves right down like this and still not find God there. And all the time, I think that the root of stillness and holy solitude on body and soul rests on this idea of holy. And holy is you're set apart from things by God for God's purposes. And God's primary purpose is our theosis, our, our deification. So you're set apart. And so there is this holy thought within yourself. And it doesn't have its roots in your discipline. It doesn't have, a, uh, doesn't have its roots in your favorite religious topic. It has its roots in the fact that at any moment of the day, God can call you on this holiness inside of you. And you are immediately transported out of your world and put into the presence of God. And it's not for your repair's sake. It's because God's got a word for you or God wants to be with you or there is a, there is a purpose that needs your attention. And it's in holiness. We were reading last night. We have a, a night office before closing down for the night. And we are reading uh, the writings of one of the des Desert Fathers of Egypt in uh, El Suriel Monastery, and he was speaking about holiness. And he was saying a nun's, a nun's purpose, a monk's purpose, is holiness. And you can, you can miss this if you are spiritually minded, but not religiously familiar. And in religion, Religion can become incredibly material and holiness becomes a bit of an icon, a bit of a, a badge you wear, but you're not actually holy inside. You're just conforming to the edicts of the religion. But spirituality takes the stuff of religion and God regurgitates that to us as a gift. And the great gift of God is holiness. Holiness means sonship with God, daughtership with God. Heavenly Father, release to your child right now the holiness that is your holiness, the holiness of their sonship or their daughtership with you. Just release that upon them so they can taste that thing that they've tasted so many times in the past. Thank you, Father. Now, Father, expand that holiness so as to include heavenly life, heavenly beings, heavenly culture, that kind of heavenly cosmos, Father. Expand it.
And you'll notice that you get a sense of being in community with people who are all holy. And when you inspect the holiness, you'll find that you are all children, regardless of your species, of the same God. And that you relate to each other out of, the, out of a courtesy, which is godliness. And there is a refinement inside of you, a delicateness, a culture, an etiquette. Etiquette is a good word inside you that loves communicating and being with these heavenly ones in the fullness of who you are. And you're not questioning yourself. There's no flaw in your self-esteem. And this holiness is clearly other than the world. You wouldn't expect to be standing in this while you were watching uh, a, an English soccer game. You'd expect to be drawn out of this if you were watching the final gridiron game in America or the baseball game that was the championship for the year. You'd be drawn out of this so as to be a part of the world of the values of those sports. But in this holiness, you find that it is rooted in your being a son of God or being a daughter of God. That's where it comes from. And you can recognize now how John Climacus says, which the common run of men are wont to find quite alien to them. And so when we look at the title of step 27 on stillness, holy solitude of body and soul, we can see that everything that we do to foster holiness inside of us is being true to our sonship or our daughtership in God. And everything that we do through our holiness, writing a book, teaching a course to others, a quiet conversation, a whisper of prayer into the heart of someone in need, everything that we do through our holiness is building our heavenly citizenship. It's building our eternal righteousness in God. It's expanding us. But the root of it is holiness. The root of it is being set apart in God's mindedness and God's parenthood and God's uncreate reality even. Being set apart in that and set apart unto ourself so that we can delight in that reality. Not delight in the fact that we are set apart, but delight in the reality that we are in that set apartness. And secondly, we can delight in the fact of having the goodness and the truth and the beauty and the, the wisdom and the life of God as coins in our pocket that we can give out as marbles that we can share with other little kids and play marbles together, as Santa Claus's sack on our back. The things that we can give out to other people are rooted in our sonship and daughtership with God and the holiness that is that. And if you read this again, Robert, would you read this again? The starting with an unruffled mind. Yes, an unruffled mind, sanctified thought, rapture towards the Lord, recollection of eternal torments, the urgency of death, constant hunger for prayer, 
unsleeping vigilance, wasting away of lust, ignorance of attachment, death to the world, loss of gluttony, a sure understanding of divine things, a well of discernment, a truce accompanied by tears, loss of talkativeness, and many such things which the common run of men are wont to find quite alien to them. When we think about writing a book or teaching other people or creating a course for educating other people, an experiential program you know, that might last a day or a weekend or a month or, or go ongoing for a year, when we think of what's the content that we could put into that course, that teaching, if you follow John Climacus' example here, you can find that you are drawing from the nature of your sonship with God or your, da your daughtership with God. You're drawing from it. You're understanding the features that are in it. And it's a beautiful thing to have step or point 37 here because you can, you can reference them very easily. And you, could, you can run your workshop on, on an unruffled mind. You know, run your run four hours on that, on sanctified thought. That's sort thought that is the result of being made holy by God. Rapture towards the Lord. I don't know how it is for you, but sometimes in the day I'll have a number of times of being raptured in the Lord, just carried into his presence and the unification of being with God. It's, it's just, it's one of the things that happens. It's just there. The recollection of eternal torments is in a monastic life, you don't come across this all that often unless you actually read about it or someone comes to you and, and talks about it. But the majority of the world are without holiness. They are without knowledge and the experience of their sonship and daughtership with God. The majority of the world. And you can end up getting tangled up in the theologies of that. But it doesn't take too much in your heart to think, oh, how I wish, how I wish they could know you, Father. And then comes the next question of how can I help them to know you, Father? And the next one after that is, I lived as Jesus. Try that. And your heart goes to the world. And you're not necessarily there trying to, you know, take every buried mine out of Afghanistan or change the piracy of, of the shipping routes or bring peace between the nations who are warring with each other. You're dealing with the individual heart, the billions of individual hearts, and saying, how can I, and I can't do it myself, Father, but some people put their hand up and say, Father, I have a love for these people, but I don't want to be like every other evangelist who, who, touches hearts and brings people into church and then three years later they're out of church, they could care less, they've experienced what church is about and it's kind of like, so what? I would so love to be an instrument for your theosis, Father, to be an instrument to touch people so that they not only get their sonship and daughtership with you, Father, but they can go the extra miles that you've got. I'd love for that to happen, Father. A lot of Christianity, of course, says, well, that's not going to happen until the Lord returns and wipes out all of the dead heads and, and creates the world anew. And that's a, that's a great answer, but 
It's not going to happen like that. Let's have a look at, at step 38. Uh, Rini, would you read this 38 and 39 for us, please? 38. And here are the signs of those who are practicing solitude in the wrong way. Dearth of spiritual wealth, increase of anger, a hoard of resentment, diminution of love, growth of vanity, and I will be silent about all the rest which follow. Praise God. <laughs> 39. But our chapter has now reached the point at which we must consider the case of those living in obedience. All the more so because this chapter is especially meant for them. Continue with 40 and the next page. 40. The signs of those who are lawfully unadulterously and sincerely wedded to this orderly and fair obedience, both in reality and according to the teaching of the inspired fathers, are those, are these, and every day, if only we have consecrated a day to the Lord, they reach forward and obtain increase and progress so that they become perfect in due time an increase of elementary humility, a lessening of bad temper, for how can it not decrease as the gall is exhausted, dissipation of darkness, access of love, estrangement from passions, deliverance from hatred, diminution of lust through continual scrutiny, Ignorance of despondency, increase of zeal, compassionate love, banishment of pride. This is the achievement which all should seek, but few attain. A well without water does not deserve the name. And what follows, he who is capable of thought already knows great work of quiet or contemplation is a means or cause of greater progress than the active life of a community. Pacomius's foundation at Tevanissi was famed for its cenobitic character, whereas the desert of Skeet was a centre for solitaries in the 4th century and later. In the spiritual life we must begin with the humbler virtues and climb by them to the heights, just as a ladder is used to elevate one from a lower to a higher state. Let's um, have a look at, at 41. And see, I think we've probably come to the end of getting the essence out of this particular step, step 27. We're recognizing the difference in phases between the acquisition of stillness and holiness and the phase then of living in that stillness and holiness and the expectation that at some point we're going to be able to look back down upon that as our journey, such as John Climacus himself is doing, and you can recognize that in John Climacus' own experience of being in solitude, away from the responsibilities of being the abbot of, of St. Catherine Monastery, where he is privileged with God to be elevated sufficiently to look back upon the journey into holy love, into, into the fullness of the love that comes with, with um, theosis. He's in this position. And so I can fully understand, as anyone can understand, if they've written, for example, about spiritual matters, that in the writing of them, you become even greater than you were at the beginning of your writing. 
if you're running a course or you're teaching somebody something, you, you become far more edified and stronger in your position as you grow through the process of presenting that material to somebody else or formalizing it in the case of a book. And so John, at step 27, John has now got 26 steps beneath him, far more clarified than they probably ever were in any conversation that he had with anyone. And so he's now, as far as these steps go, he's now in this more advanced position of he's not researching it, he's not finding it, he's not living in it, he's beyond it where he can now comment upon the finding and the living of it. And that position is a, that's a third phase of, of every one of these steps. And so it's valuable to know, I think it's valuable to know that these, these phases exist so that when we do reach the point of being able to comment about it authentically, we will pass out of that phase and some new phase of interest will come to us. And we should invite that. But we can only invite that if we've got in our own hearts and minds a sense of eternal journey and that we will never lose God and God will never lose us. And there is no fear whatsoever in our relationship with God. It's certified. It's guaranteed. It's been proven. It's been rubber stamped. And you will be given the evidence from others of the heavens who treat you as someone who is of the same heavenly family as they. And when you walk in that certification, that certitude, that assurance, then every new thing that comes upon you is God's will and God's beauty and goodness and truth are in that and it, it will withstand all things. And if you happen to be killed in the process of doing it, that's cool. You know, you, you've, you've done God's will in it and that's what matters to you. So let's... Um, Let's just have a look at this. My mindedness is to speak to people who might pick this one up, for example, and say, I have no idea what you're, what you're talking about. I have no idea how to start my theosis journey. I have no idea about the transformations you're talking about. They're just, they're just not known to me. You know, what would you say? How would you speak to that kind of a person? the person for whom renunciation of the world is, is just a dream, just an idea. D does it mean going apart to my garage once a week and just sitting in my garage away from my house? You know, what, what actually is it? <coughs> humility is, you know, what actually is humility? What's the power of humility? How can I be humble when everybody around me is a pirate wanting everything from me? Um, like I'd be an idiot to to sacrifice everything that I've worked so hard for, wouldn't I? And how do you speak into the lives of these young in spirit who have no idea about how to stand in the maturity of theosis? It's a challenging question, isn't it? And the only answer that I can come up with in reply of that is what Jesus said to his disciples. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and when you're challenged, have no fear, have no thought for what you're about to say because you will speak as God speaks in you and it will be the voice of the Father inside of you who speaks in you and through you and with you. And that requires stillness, holy solitude of body and soul. <laughs> And so this is your teaching. You come into a situation where only God can provide the answer. I, I'll tell you the story. One time I came in to, to preach 
Tommy Griffin asked me to come and preach at a friend's church. The friend is now deceased, but he was the pastor of a church near Tallahassee, Florida, in a town no, no, 20 minutes away from Tallahassee, Florida. And so I had, I had my servant. I, I got it all arranged. Father, what do you want me to preach on? Okay, I'll get this. I've got my scriptures ready. I've got the ideas pretty much ready for, for preaching. <coughs> and so I turn up at the church, and the church is full of American flags. American flags are hanging everywhere. I don't know it because we don't have something like this in our day except for Anzac Day. This is Patriots Day, I think they call it where America honors all of the servicemen and women who are and have been active overseas as well as currently in the nation. Well, this is, this is absolutely foreign to me. I have no idea about this. You know, I've seen a few movies and, and read a few stories and been told a few things, but it's not in my blood at all. It's not in my soul. It's not in my spirit. It's just like, glory to God, what's this? It's like walking into Disneyland and you've never ever heard of Mickey Mouse, you know, like it's, uh, kind of it's interesting, but you know, what's it got to do with me? And I'm the preacher. And I came in with Sam Camp, God love him, and Sam happened to have long hair, and I think he may have even had a mustache and a beard at the time. And the local pastor met Sam thinking that Sam was me because he thought that I was that kind of a person. And here I was in short hair and a, a suit and a, a tie and you know, Bible under my arm sort of thing. And, and I, was just, I was just the accompanying baggage. Sam Camp was going to be the guy. And he looked on Sam Camp with such disdain. <laughs> I feel really sorry for Sam. Sam's the loveliest guy. I just love him like a brother. He's this beautiful, beautiful man. And he's he's talked down to by this by this pastor, who's obviously, yeah, I don't know, I don't know what he was thinking. So I I listen to I listen to these people, and I'm sitting on the front row as as you do as a pastor in these kind of Protestant churches. <coughs> And his wife stands up and she is crying. She's weeping because of all of the heartbreak that goes into the American families. America is, America is the war machine of the world. And with it, of course, comes all of the torment that goes into the families, the, the displacement of families, the loss of family structure and when the when the men or the women are killed and so forth. And then the pain of the disfigurement of when they come back from war and they've lost arms and limbs and, and eyes and ears and mouths and senses and so on. And so it's, you know, the, the country breeds, puts itself in a position of creating great family distress. And so here is the pastor's wife, and she's up there, and she's crying like a, like a baby about these things. And I'm sitting there still thinking, Lord, is there some way that I can, you know, exit this and, and leave them to it? Because they really need somebody of their own blood to, 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 to preach to them today. You know, like any American could preach better than what I'm about to preach, surely, as, as a foreigner, as an alien, as the Americans want to call people, not American, an alien. We only use that if you come from planet Zargon, you know, or from the other side of the universe. For the American, an alien is just anybody south or north or east or west of the border. And, and so in, in all humility and love for these people, I'm thinking they really deserve somebody real, what can I, you know, and my sermon has so got nothing to do with the day. And it was an extraordinary uh, lesson from God. But he said, no, 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 wait, stay here. You know, you're the man. So I thought, okay. So I got up and preached. And my sermon didn't come out of my pocket. You know, what I'd prepared had nothing to do with what was the day about it all, which sometimes happens when you when you are preaching. God gets you to prepare for something and you're all wrapped up in this one thing and all of a sudden it takes a left hand turn and you're you're somewhere which you 
and now go to fly by the seat of your pants, you're, you're really on. You're right, right at the front of the propeller of your plane. <laughs> and so there I am preaching. And I preached to a church full of really wonderful American men and women and children for whom Patriot Day is as probably more significant than Christmas. It's the lifeblood of the nation. And just before coming up, I said to Jesus, I said, Lord, what should, what should I say? And he says, say what I give you. I thought, okay, well, that's a rescue. So I get up there, and probably within the first two sentences, there is this fusion of mind between myself and the Lord Jesus Christ. And my mind is poised like a cat on a mouse watching for the very next word that will follow on from the last word. And I have no idea where it's going. I have no idea what, what the sentence is going to mean at the end of the sentence. I have only Christ, and I'm totally trusting Christ, and I'm not channeling it, I'm, right, I'm there, I'm, I'm the man. But my mind is working in such a way as to speak right into the hearts of these people, people I don't know, about a topic I have no idea about. And it's not mystical, it's not magical, it's not nothing. It's just absolutely real. And it's not a gift of the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's a gift of faith, who knows? But for me it was, it was fairly terrifying. And at the end of the meeting, I thought it went down like a lead balloon. I thought, oh, yeah, you know, I'm not going to get much of a standing ovation for this one. I, you know, I'm glad I'm not trying to take a collection or anything on this because a, you know, a walk down in 20 is not going to bring too many, too many nickels into the, into the plate. At the end of it, the preacher comes back up onto the stage, up onto the platform, and he is... Uh, He's, he's very pleasantly surprised, especially now because he's thinking, what was I thinking when I thought that the guy with the long hair and the beard was Rob Cricket, when clearly this guy is preaching from a whole other position <laughs> from what I imagined he would be bringing. And all of a sudden this black guy stands up. Now, we were like, I don't know, black's an American word, I suppose. I don't know what it is, but African-American chap stands up from the back and he says, he's driven up from, from what's the other city down there in Florida? Um, Tampa. Driven up from Tampa, Florida because the Lord led him up from Tampa, Florida that morning to this particular church. Like, go figure. And so this guy is probably about, I don't know, 50s, high 50s, you know, big man, bearded man, strong man, not an elegant looking man, a, a kind of a, a field farmer kind of a man, stands up from one of the few rows in the back there, stands up and says, where he's driven from, I've driven from Tampa, Florida, to, I've driven from Tampa to come up here to this little they're like a two-bit town, a really small little town. And um, at the Lord's direction. And he said, and the prayer on my heart was, I wanted to see who's God's man of the hour. I wanted to see who can lead America back into its real spirituality, to the spirituality that the founding fathers said. You know, all of a sudden the Patriots Day goes right back to the founding fathers. And, you know, this is, here's this bloke just laying it down thick as... And, and he said, and what I heard today, and he points at, he points at me where I'm sitting. I'm, I'm sort of looking around like this thinking, gee, is this what happens in American churches out in the, in the, in the boonies here? You know, is, this, is this what they do? <laughs> and, and this guy is pointing at me saying, 
this is the man who's going to lead America into the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking, oh, God, no, 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 Lord, no, no. I should, I should never have come <laughs> to this church. Like, Well, of course, they're sitting in a white man's church. I think he was the only, only colored gentleman in the whole church. Uh, it's not the sort of thing that's going to go down real well um, from my understanding within American church systems. Um, and I certainly didn't want to be all that he was pointing to. The thing that I got from it, I suppose, were these two or three things. That a small church unto itself doesn't have much vision. And it, it satisfies itself with what's really good and heartfelt. And then someone who's inspired by God in search of more of God, for very real reasons, rocks up into their company and can identify what the whole nation is lacking and needs. And it needs leadership of some kind. I suppose people are looking to, to um, the Kennedy candidate at the moment, hoping that anything's going to be better than the current politicians. And some people will be looking to Kennedy saying, yeah, he's, he's the man of the hour. He's going to lead America into the new way. But here is this fellow comes into this, this little church, never been here in his life, a Floridian man who is touched by the word that's preached and he realizes that's the voice of Christ and that's the voice we all need to hear. So he's got faith for hearing the voice of Christ. And I wasn't expecting any, any comment like that at all. I wasn't expected to be run out of the church. I kind of expected the fact that there was no comment by the pastor or anyone on what I preached. He just immediately turned it back to Patriot's Day and, and the mindedness of the church parishioners, you know, which is his job to do. But here was this one guy, and he had faith to hear Jesus' word from Jesus. And I have to say, that sermon, nobody recorded it, praise God, but um, I have to say that that was Jesus' word. It wasn't, it wasn't my mind. It wasn't my, my thought. It wasn't my preparation. I spoke exactly what Jesus said to me, word by word. If, if I said the word that, I had no idea what the next word was going to be at all. I just spoke it calmly. I had to be in this stillness and this holy solitude of body and soul. In this predicament that I knew nothing about how to speak into it. And here was this African-American gentleman who had faith far beyond the measure of those in the church, I would say, because he came to church wanting to hear Jesus. And so many times in church, we go to church, we don't hear Jesus at all. We hear, we hear church policy. Or we hear the favourite topic of the, of the preacher. We don't hear... Jesus, you've got to have faith for hearing Jesus. And this faith for hearing Jesus is the faith for hearing God, which has its roots, as John Climacus has said, in humility and renunciation of the world. And so I think the thing that I would point you to in writing or speaking or teaching or commanding the attention of young people is helping them to have faith for hearing God. I'm, I'm reading a lovely, a lovely writing at the moment by a fellow only recently deceased who was the abbot of a, of a, uh, a monastery, an Orthodox monastery in, um, in Greece on Mount Athos. And his his opening chapter is a conversation 
a lengthy two-day conversation that he had with a group of sisters who uh, became the nuns in a convent that he helped to build nearby Athos, which is a man-only environment. A lovely, lovely monastery, and they have they have a beautiful singing. These sisters, their chant is, is very, very nice. And his first chapter is the journey of the soul. And so we would we would point people, newcomers, to the journey of the soul, so that they know what am I in for, what am I going for, where am I heading, and. Are you at the tail end of it? Are you speaking to me about having arrived so that I'm not just getting someone halfway through who doesn't quite know how it all ends, except for a few ideas they've got? Are you actually standing at the end point? And can you talk me through? Can I look to you as a witness of Jesus? Can I hear Jesus' words in your faith? And in hearing Jesus' words in your faith, can I hear the Father in your faith? And if they've got a big imagination or taken too much acid, they might say, can I hear in your faith, not only Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit, but all of the heavens as well? Can I hear that in you? Because if I can hear that in you, then I know I can perfectly trust you to the end of my days, wherever the end of my days might take me. I don't know any young person who would have the nous, or as they say in Greek, the nous, the spiritual mindedness, to even come up with that question. But that's certainly in their heart. The heart of the trusting young person, the young man, the young woman, in, in, in their faith is, do you actually know what it's all about? And if you've got the honesty to say no, then I'll applaud you for that, but I'll continue searching for that person who does know what it's all about so that I can put my perfect trust in that person. I can go move close to that person. I can follow what Christ is saying and doing in that person. I can believe in Christ the better by how Christ manifests in that person's faith. So now I'd like to invite the Father to come in to you with a gift and it's the gift of fragrance that can enable you to speak Christ, to speak the Father in a better way than you ever have done in the past, in a way that is more enhancing to you, that is more believable to your audience that is more of Christ on the earth and in the heavens, that is more of the uncreate God who will never enter into creation and his presence in creation. The gift that is entirely rooted in your stillness and your holy solitude of body and soul. that is inclusive of all 30 steps of John Climacus Ladder of Divine Ascent, including holy love, intimacy with God, fellowship with God through theosis, through deification, a gift. This is what the Father is saying. I'm relaying to you what the Father has for you to make you better at what you do and to make what you do a thousandfold more easily accepted. It doesn't take too much of making 
my or our beeswax candles down in the barn, it doesn't take too much before the whole place is buzzing with bees and wasps and bumblebees who want a piece of that. God is the natural attraction to the soul. And God's greatest desire in the world is to have people in whom he can put his gift of enhanced attractiveness. And he doesn't necessarily need you to be attractive. He just needs what you do and say and write to be attractive. And in the doing of that, you'll become more attractive in yourself anyway. That's your problem. You have to deal with people about that. But his gift is saying, my child, I am so thrilled with what you do and with who you are and how you are. And today, I'm going to add to you something that will enhance that a thousandfold. To take the most perfect flower in the garden and beautify it even more. To take the best tasting curry in the world and give it enhanced flavour without making it so cosmic as to be useless in the world but actually to make it more attractive, a great strength, a great draw card to me, God. And all you have to do is agree that that would be a good thing to have. And by your faith, it's yours. And within the next few hours of this day, you'll already notice it starting to reveal itself in who you are and what you do. By your faith, it has now become yours. I, God, your Father, who feed people who are ten times your age, who are a thousand times your age, who are a million times your lifetime I am still feeding them and so I'm stretching your imagination and I'm stretching your capacity to be flexible and giving you the greatest possible gift you can use right now seeing as how you are so good at what you do right now is to become better and better by my power and my love and my goodness, my truth, my beauty. Amen. Next week we'll have a look at step 28. Whatever that is. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Love her very dearly through Christ and through the deification of Christ into the eternal wonder of our paradise lives together. Amen. See you in a week. Amen.